Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the uh, Inner Forth Landscape Partnership for inviting me to speak here today. It's really great to see a, a really uh, full room and a, a good diverse audience. We run a, SNH runs a Sharing Good Practice event on invasive species every year, and I was a little bit concerned that our date was clashing with this because we ran it uh, on marine invasives across an open just a uh, um, couple weeks ago, but I can see about two or three people who were at that event, so it's great to see a completely new audience <laughs> and uh, a lot of new faces too compared to our Sharing Good Practice events, so that's really good to know that there's other people out there interested in invasive species. Um, I've been asked to give a, a sort of national overview, uh, so I'm going to cover uh, a little bit about the um, context and legislation, a little bit on the new regulation and on the strategy, uh, and then major more on the sort of Scottish approach, what are we doing in Scotland. Um, I'll try and, try and keep the legislation bit uh, to a minimum so that it's not too dull. Right, um, so yeah, my role with SNH, I'm the Invasive Non-Native Species uh, Advisor. Um, I also manage the uh, wildlife management teams, so there's quite a crossover within what we do in terms of uh, um, managing invasive species and what we uh, advise on managing um, mainly, mainly mammals, um, so deer management, goose, ma goose management, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, um, Paul's already uh, set the context really well. Uh, I just thought I'd put this up just to show the... Um, really in a nutshell what the problem is. This is... Uh, this graph is um, draws on some of the same data that Paul already showed you, but it's got it shows the uh, um, number of species arriving in Europe uh, in 50-year intervals. So as you can see, it, back in the early 1800s, it was very few species, uh, and as we gradually uh, progressed into the 20th century up to present day, it's really increasing. Um, for comparison, uh, the, the, rate of, uh, the rate of introduction into Great Britain is still relatively small. We're sort of talking uh, maybe about 10 to 12 new species a year, uh, probably even fewer, to, fewer into Scotland. Um, so uh, we've got um, something like just, just, uh, just over, uh, just under 2,000 um, uh, non-native uh, non species established in Great Britain and only about 1,100 in Scotland. Um, similarly, the, the cost uh, of uh, non-native species there, the 12 billion uh, euros figure, uh, probably an underestimate, like all these uh, economic um, uh, estimates, they're based on uh, fairly scant data and then you extrapolate up, so uh, large error bars on it. Uh, the equivalent figure in uh, pounds sterling for GB is about 1.8 billion pounds per annum, the cost of invasive species, i.e. The, the cost of managing them and also the cost to, uh, of the damage that they cause. And it's something like 146 million is the equivalent figure in, uh, in Scotland. Um, but remember, of those, uh, uh, all those species that are arriving, only about uh, 8 to 10% are going to be invasive. So it's, all, it's about... We can't do something about all of them. Um, well, we can. we can. We can try and reduce reduce that rate. But once they've arrived, we need to try and pick those ones that are really going to be um, uh, invasive and do something about. Um, and yeah, and the, 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 the drivers behind that are the increase in global trade, global travel. Um, and also, uh, interestingly, um, a lot of the species arriving in Great Britain uh, in the sort of uh, 18th, 19th century were coming from Europe, um, but increasingly they're coming from other temperate parts of the world, uh, from North America, uh, increasingly um, East Asia, uh, and a few from South America and Australasia too. So uh, this is the, uh, the legal bit. Um, so. The, well, the uh, legislation on non-native species in uh, the UK is covered by the Wildlife and Countryside Act, Section 14, um, and it's really all about prevention. Uh, if you remember that uh, CBD uh, hierarchy um, 
uh, slide that Paul showed you, uh, the principle is that prevention is the top thing that you try and do. Then it's about surveillance, uh, early detection and rapid response uh, where you can. And then uh, obviously managing a problem once it's established uh, can be really expensive and really costly and you can't always do it. Um, so the Wildlife and Countryside Act is all about prevention. So that's where these uh, release offences come in. It's an offence uh, in Scotland to uh, release, uh, for, for animals, to release, allow them to escape or uh, cause to be at a place out with their native range. And for plants, it's an offence to plant in the wild or uh, to uh, cause to grow in the wild, um, out with, a plant out with its native range. Um, there, so um, there have been relatively, relatively few uh, prosecutions um, uh, under these uh, these offences. Um, I think there was one fairly high profile one down in uh, Cumbria where there was uh, sacred ibis were escaping from a zoo, uh, South Lake Zoo. Uh, the owner of the zoo and the zoo itself were um, were fined to the order of um, uh, several several thousand pounds. Um, uh, there was also uh, just last week there was another uh, case in North Wales, uh, and it was actually f um, release of wild boar. Somebody had broken into a wild boar farm uh, with the purpose of trying to steal the, the wild boar for selling on. Uh, obviously weren't very good at it and quite a few, uh, few escaped but uh, these, uh, these people were um, fine not only for damage that they caused but also for uh, release, releasing a, a non-native species. Now, now I know that some of you will disagree that wild boar were formerly native to Great Britain so how come it gets caught by this bit of legislation? Well it's, it's really just the way that uh, it's uh, legislative convenience but it's also because we don't want um, uh, every, every Tom, Dick and Harry um, uh, releasing uh, wild boar all over the place. Um, don't stop with boar, wild boar, then it'll be lynx, and then it's wolves and bears. So it's, it's covered by the same uh, bit of legislation. And it's really to make sure that people uh, um, follow the IUCN guidelines for uh, translocations and conservation translocations and reintroductions. Um, and that the releases can be licensed similar in the same way that the uh, um, the licensed uh, introduction reintroduction of beaver was carried out in that deal. But as we all know, that some were uh, released illegally elsewhere as well. Um, so yeah, there's been relatively few prosecutions. I think it's probably uh, fair to say that uh, it's due to the uh, level of evidence required. Um, you almost need to catch somebody in the act of uh, releasing or to have clear evidence linking the, uh, the animal or plant in the wild back to the person who uh, owned it or released it. Um, there has never been a prosecution for the planting in the wild or causing to grow in the wild as far as I know. And the causing to grow one it would be particularly difficult to prove unfortunately. Um, Having said that, it's quite important that, you, that these uh, offences exist because they're there to provide a, um, uh, a legal requirement for you know, companies and businesses uh, to meet their legal ob obligations. They need to take account of uh, non-native species issues, not to plant them uh, where they shouldn't be planting them, and also to take account of biosecurity. So it's quite important that these laws are there. But there's a, often an expectation that we'll be fining lots of people, and that doesn't happen. So uh, it's quite important to get that across. Um, the legislation also covers uh, bans on um, keeping uh, for things like uh, crayfish, a number of invasive fish, uh, mink, um, koi pew, uh, muskrat, muntjac, those sorts of things. Um, you can get a license for, for, uh, for keeping some of them. For example, one or two zoos have got a license for keeping Muntjac. Um, there's also uh, provisions in the uh, Wildlife and Countryside Act now for um, uh, relevant bodies like SNH, SEPA or Forestry Commission or Marine Scotland to uh, make 
take species control orders which uh, require um, a landowner or a, 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 an owner occupier of a premises to uh, take particular steps to control or eradicate a non-native species. Um, and also, uh, there's a, the, the law requires us to offer a species control agreement in the first instance. Sorry, I'm going to stand well away from that. Uh, it's not really helping, is it? <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, we, we can make these qu uh, fairly, fairly draconian orders, um, but we have to offer a species, uh, voluntary agreement in the first instance. Um, unless it's an emergency case, in which case we can um, uh, we can make an emergency control order. So just to summarise, it's really it's all about prevention. This uh, this this legislation, uh, and there are one or two bits that in, in there that can help us with management, um, but it's really geared up to to, to deal with prevention. Uh, and important also to note that there's no general duty on land managers or land uh, or owners of non-native species to control the species on their land. Um, so that's uh, that's often quite, uh, uh, quite often misunderstood that somebody's got giant hogweed or Japanese knotweed. Well, surely they should be legally required to do something about it. Um, and uh, whilst we can make a species control agreement or order. Uh, there's a limited number of situations where we can do that. Um, so, who is responsible? Um, oops. Yeah. That's, uh, who's responsible for controlling inns? Well, um, primarily it's the land manager is responsible, even though there's no legal requirement on them to do it. Uh, it's the same as you know uh, managing any other uh, plant or animal that's on your land. Um, also, individuals uh, moving things around. If you think about the uh, the fishermen and uh, uh, boat owners that um, were moving the Pontocaspian species around, um, they've got a responsibility to uh, take reasonable steps not to do that. So, follow, following the uh, check, clean, dry protocol that uh, non-native species secretaria and all the other organisations promote. Um, uh, communities too, there's a number of, uh, of uh, um, uh, community-led initiatives to control uh, invasive species, particularly high-profile uh, one down in the Scilly Isles controlling rats on some of the islands there. Um, industry, uh, best, uh, we work quite closely with certain industries developing codes of practice around uh, invasive non-native species. Um, uh, public agencies like SNH, uh, local authorities. I think the, the sort of take home message is really that we have a shared responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of uh, one, uh, one person or one organisation. Um, right, um, so, oh, skipped. Yeah, so again, the, the um, uh, the code of practice uh, on non-native species um, uh, provides uh, advice on how to act responsibly in it within the law if you uh, if you um, manage land or if you uh, are responsible for non-native species. Um, it also covers uh, a number of other things, such as um, the, these offences that I was talking about, about are strict liability offences, which means that uh, the, uh, the court doesn't need to show um, uh, that you uh, uh, recklessness or that you uh, deliberately release a non-native species. Um, it's enough just to show that you, that you did it, although as we said earlier, that's quite hard to sh prove. But that does mean that you can have a defence of due diligence, i.e. that you carried out, uh, took reasonable steps, followed codes of practice. Um, so that's really where this hook comes in from the, the law into codes of practice and that makes it uh, quite important uh, that um, individuals and companies and, uh, and others follow the codes of practice that are out there and try and avoid spreading non-native species. Um, and the, uh, the, this 
particular code of practice covers covers some of that at a fairly high level. It won't it won't answer all your questions, but it does cover some issues around you know what is a release and what isn't and what's in the wild when it comes to planting non-native plants, etc. Um, and it also includes a framework of responsibilities. So this issue about which which agency is responsible for what. Um, so it sets out uh, habitat leads. Um, so, uh, for example, it's uh, SEPA in freshwater marine Scotland for the marine. Uh, Forest Commission cover terrestrial trees and shrubs. They don't cover everything that's in woodlands, although they've got quite a strong interest in uh, th uh, things that eat trees, pest species, for example. And SNH covers everything else on land, um, including wetlands and sort of water's edge habitats. Um, so, uh, habitat leads provide advice, um, determine priorities, coordinate action, um, but importantly, we don't uh, we don't have um, dedicated teams to go out there and control non-native species. I mean, certain projects we, we do we do have, but uh, we tend to try and encourage uh, action through others. Um, so we're encouraging. Uh, working rivers and fisheries trusts, we're working with um, uh, you know local action groups, uh, trying to encourage them to uh, um, control non-native species, and also working quite heavily to uh, promote better biosecurity and awareness. And we have these powers, obviously, to make species control agreements and orders to. Um, and SNH also has a lead coordinating. View, uh, role as well, basically means that we take an overview of what's happening with non-native species in Scotland, uh, share that amongst the other um, habitat leads in Scottish Government, and we provide advice to the, uh, the other habitat leads as well. Um, the GB strategy, uh, it's recently been reviewed, it was uh, just republished in August uh, 2015. Um, Provides a, the review has provided a bit of uh, an update on, on progress so far. Uh, it's got clearer aims and objectives. It's um, uh, you know, probably better illustrated with case studies. Um, it's uh, I think what's really important about the GB strategy is this working together uh, with uh, England and Wales, um, and increasingly we're actually doing more work with Ireland too. Um, but it does mean that we can. Uh, it's much easier to manage the issue of invasive non-native species at an island level, particularly because a lot of the things that uh, they have in uh, England and Wales we don't have yet. Uh, we can find out more about them and hopefully prevent them getting here um, with uh, good, good management and good luck. Um, and there's also an implementation plan published this time too. So if you want to find out what. GB is doing about a particular topic, you can go in and look at that and uh, hold this to account. Um, the EU regulation uh, on invasive alien species uh, came into force in January 2015. Um, it includes these uh, restrictions on import, keeping, breeding, sale, transportation, use, growing and release. Uh, quite a mouthful. Um, quite why you need that when it's really Keeping and release would probably cover it, but anyway, such as such as life. Um, uh, it also requires um, prevention and early detection of species that haven't arrived in your country and uh, rapid eradication where where feasible. Uh, and for those that are already well established, uh, management uh, of invasive you have to have a, um, a an appropriate management plan, and it applies to uh, a list of. 37 species of EU concern. That's the, the initial list. Uh, there's a process for adding to it, and I'm sure it will get added to. Um, and the, the initial list of 37 species was published just uh, about the 15th of July, around the middle of July this year. So um, there's been a bit of a, a time lag till that list was published, and then we've got 18 months to implement it all. So the implementation is going. Uh, head full uh, full steam ahead despite Brexit. Um, I can't honestly see this being a bit of legislation that uh, the UK wouldn't implement, given that we were quite uh, instrumental in uh, uh, pushing it through in the first place. Um, 
So this is uh, just a few of the species on this list. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, so there's uh, a number of things that uh, aren't in the, uh, the UK yet. Um, for example, raccoons, sacred ibis, um, this um, marbled crayfish, uh, and oh, the Asian hornet. Yeah. So I think the the, the first three I mentioned there are things that they're. Um, well, they shouldn't be in the trade in the case of uh, marble crayfish. You shouldn't be importing them. But there are raccoons and sacred ibis in, uh, in zoos. People keep uh, raccoons as pets. But I think with good management, good uh, awareness raising, uh, we can probably uh, prevent them. Uh, probably harder to keep a a Asian hornet out. There is a rapid response plan, but they're likely to come across the channel. Um, uh, and I guess if we can catch them early enough, we will be able to uh, eradicate them. But they're only going to come again, so uh, I think I would imagine that's one that will eventually get established. Um, there's a number of species that are established in Great Britain, but not in uh, Scotland yet. So uh, Asian clam, um, floating pennywort, where is it there? Um, uh, water primrose and American bullfrog. Um, and yeah, a number of these, there's already eradication programs and uh, American bullfrog may well be eradicated by now with a bit of luck. Um, and then there's a number of things like uh, grey squirrels, uh, skunk cabbage and uh, American signal crayfish, which unfortunately we already have in Scotland. Um, and as part of GB, we need to have an appropriate management plan in place for those. And uh, we probably do for... Um, Grey squirrel through the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrel um, Action Plan, um, but the others, we need to develop those. Um, and then there's a few species like uh, the red-eared slider and the water hyacinth, which is one of the most invasive plants in the world, but uh, not particularly invasive in our climate. Um, it does grow in one or two of the Manchester canals, but it's not spreading. So I think these are ones that uh, we'll probably have to implement bans on trade. I think there should already be a ban on trade in these uh, sliders, but um, uh, they won't be ones that we'll have to do much more about in Scotland. So, um, as we said, what well, the trick is to, uh, these species aren't of equal invasiveness. Uh, the trick is to try and work out which are the ones we really want to worry about and which are the ones that uh, we can uh, we can spend less time and attention on. So we went through a horizon scanning exercise in Scotland um, last year, no, sorry, in 2014. Um, it was based on a GB horizon scanning exercise. Um, and it identified those species that are um, uh, not yet established in Scotland, uh, are invasive elsewhere, uh, and have the potential um, to arrive. Um, and the objectives are really to mi minimise the risk of uh, those species arriving and uh, to uh, detect them early and do something about it. Um, you know, sir, I said an appropriate response there because uh, I think the CBD would say rapid eradication, but uh, it's not always possible in every situation. Once you've discovered something, sometimes it's, uh, it's too late to eradicate, but there doesn't mean you can't do something about it to contain it or uh, prevent its further spread. Um, so these are some of the actions uh, um, associated with these prevention priorities. So um, uh, prioritising uh, pathways, um, we've already produced a pathway action plan for, uh, for zoos, which we're promoting to the um, zoos and wildlife parks in Scotland. Um, maybe not a think of them being a big risk, but a number of the animal species that we have uh, in the UK were originally imported uh, and escaped from zoos and wildlife parks. Um, uh, sightings reported, uh, there's numerous ways for you to report sightings. Uh, you've probably all seen these nature locator apps uh, for plant tracker, aqua invaders and uh, sea life uh, tracker. Um, if, it's, if it is something that's uh, of high importance, that's uh, likely to become very invasive, probably the best thing to do would be to phone the Sears hotline, Scotland's Environment uh, uh, and Rural uh, uh, Services. Um, 
uh, it's the it's also the same numbers to see per flood line and things like that I think but you you'll get through to a 24 uh, a help desk that's managed manned, uh, uh, 24 7 so your re report will definitely get to the the right person if you do that there's also a, a new invasive species um, portal uh, reporting portal on the uh, Scotland's environment website uh, we also have rapid response plans um, in place uh, Research, um, for example, um, uh, Lucy Anderson at Leeds University uh, did some research on uh, use of hot water for biosecurity for aquatic invasives um, and awareness raising likes of uh, Be Plant Wise and Check Clean Dry. Um, and these are just some of the um, prevention priorities. Uh, I think, yeah, I've already sort of covered things, the, the, the ones that... Um, Things like raccoon and chipmunk and muntjac, um, working with zoos and pet owners, uh, things like uh, the ruddy duck, um, topmouth gudgeon, water primrose, there's already eradication programs underway for those. Um, things like these uh, uh, Asian uh, mussel, uh, sorry, Asian clams, the um, uh, zebra mussel and quagga mussel, uh, the various species of uh, crayfish, um, the Dicarogamorous shrimps, Ponte Caspian species, uh, these are all things where uh, prevention is the key really. Uh, usually when you discover a, a population of these um, it's already too late and you can't eradicate them so the key is prevention and uh, I'm sure that uh, Scottish canals might be, have some good uh, stories to tell about that in the workshop uh, later on today so I won't steal their thunder. Um, uh, also there's a few things like uh, um, Chinese mitten crab, which uh, whilst prevention will hopefully slow them down, they'll get here eventually because they, uh, the um, the larvae um, they go back go into the sea to spawn, so they're going to get here on currents uh, already. And we've already had one report of one in the Clyde, uh, or at least a, a shed um, skin of one in the Clyde, um, and some sort of rather strange ways things get in the uh, American lobster. There was uh, somebody thought it would be a good idea to rescue an American lobster from a, a restaurant and release it at Ardross and that uh, hit the papers the other, the, 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 during the summer. Um, and then just very quickly, uh, management priorities. We went through a similar process for uh, management priorities. Um, so these are species that are established in Scotland. We also, s they had to be ones that were, it was possible to control them. Uh, and there was a benefit to controlling them, um, and the aim is to minimise the impacts. Um, so some of the actions that we need to consider for these are um, considering strategic uh, plans. Uh, for example, Forest Commission and SNH uh, are just about to publish uh, a national approach for rhododendron, um, obviously one of our most invasive plants and one that we spent a lot of money on. Um, we felt it was needed a, a national approach to try and pr prioritise the spending a bit better. Um, uh, land managers should um, consider the benefits of uh, controlling these species on, on their land and we're also uh, trying to make sure that there are um, incentives available through uh, the likes of agri-environment schemes for controlling them. Um, pathways of spread should be managed and also promoting good practice for control, that's quite important. And uh, these are the management priorities. They're a relatively uh, small number. Um, so there's the three riparian invasive plants there, Japanese knotweed, or several species of knotweed. Uh, as, as you're probably aware, giant knotweed is hybrid, and also the um, uh, Himalayan knotweed, uh, giant hogweed, Himalayan balsam. Rhododendron, um, we also uh, need to think about uh, skunk cabbage, that's one that's um, on the EU list, so uh, we need to think about strategic control for that. Um, the uh, mammals that are um, uh, on the list are grey squirrel, which already have a, um, a grey squirrel action plan for. Uh, mink, we've got control programmes in the Hebrides for those, and also in the north of Scotland. Uh, there's a number of local initiatives uh, uh, in place as well. Um, and then these other ones are all priorities for islands. They're not necessarily priorities for uh, mainland Scotland. So uh, rats, obviously, uh, on seabird islands. Um, uh, hedgehogs, uh, particularly in the US, where they, uh, they eat wader eggs with 
a long-term pro control project there, uh, and just uh, in, de in development at the moment is a project to control uh, Stoats on Orkney. Uh, the Stoats got onto Orkney about um, uh, getting on for seven or eight years ago now. Um, and the risk is that they, um, not so much that they predate on hen harriers, but they'll predate the, uh, uh, the Orkney vole, uh, which are the food for the hen, ha hen harriers and shorted owls, which are the, uh, the, the, SP, the special protection area interest there. Uh, and just lastly, um, uh, Gunnera that uh, uh, David mentioned, um, that's particularly a problem in North Harris, um, and we've got, uh, we're just starting project with North Harris Trust, um, <coughs> a big problem in the west of Ireland. So I'm already over time, so I better cut myself short there, but if there's any questions, ask me after the, the next speaker.